the recording? Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, very pleased to welcome you all to the Aizen Unido webinar series on um, countering the impacts of COVID-19 with international standards. Today's uh, session is going to be about information security management during COVID-19. And we really hope that you will find this information, this uh, session both informative and useful. Um, our session will last one hour. Um, I would like to share my screen now so we can all see the structure. Um, so as we begin, I would like to just do a quick poll with all the participants, make sure that we kind of have an idea of uh, who is in the room today with us. Following which, uh, we will have an introduction to this webinar um, by our colleagues at UNIDO. And uh, then we will have the main presentation by our expert, uh, Dr. Edward Humphreys. And then there will be a Q&A for all participants um, to ask questions from the expert. Now, a quick uh, word on that, that we will have, we have an enormous volume of questions already um, that you've given us through the registration. So we will uh, probably not actually, certainly not be able to answer them all, but we will do our best. And we will take a selection of both questions submitted during registration and questions that you can post in the Q&A live. Um, so now, without further ado, um, we'd like to just launch one of the polls. I would be very um, appreciative if you could quickly answer these, uh, as we don't want to spend too much time on them. The first one is going to help us to understand who is in the room with us today. We're now at 50% who have voted. Just a few more seconds and then we will close this poll. Okay, let's close it here. So the vast majority, um, well vast, 26% uh, are uh, from the IT or cybersecurity uh, specialist group. Um, and uh, following which we have 15% uh, of you are from private sector and international organizations and um, basically then conformity assessment and so on. Excellent. Now, um, let me see if I can launch this next one. Now the second one should be on your screens now. Now, let me read this to all of you who might not be able to see it. Um, yeah, the question is, has your company or organization been certified to ISO IEC 27001? A few more seconds. Okay, thank you for answering. So we have 52% who have not been certified to uh, 27,001, apologies, and 28% who have, and 20% are planning to do so. The next and last poll. The question is, have you witnessed increased numbers of cybersecurity breaches during the pandemic? A few more seconds. Excellent. So it looks like 41% of you have voted yes, that there are increased numbers of breaches and 16% have said no and 38% not sure. 6% of you have said that it's about the same. So it's very interesting to, to see this. Now, without further ado, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Bernardo Calzadilla Sarmiento, Managing Director of the Directorate of Digitalization, Technology and Agribusiness of UNIDO and our partner on these webinars. Bernardo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. 
from wherever the colleagues are joining this important webinar on ISO IEC 2007 and 1 information management system, information security. Information security is so key and has become so key in the framework of the COVID. COVID-19 has affected all areas of life. As you know from the UN, we look uh, uh, many aspects in uh, the long term with the lens of this sustainable development goals. And we have seen that uh, all aspects related to people, planet, prosperity have been aff affected. We have been doing an analysis of digital transformation and industrial recovery. And the most important lesson I think is that COVID-19 has become an important accelerator. We were already in an exponential phase and pace of technological transformation, but uh, uh, this uh, new normal that is bringing COVID-19 uh, has brought really a new push to what is going on. Uh, we have been discussing with Francesco just before how much standardization is, is changing. Standardization got a push for the uh, leveling the, the, the playing field uh, because now many countries, many people can participate. We are really moving into a new situation, but it's not only through the video conferencing, but we have uh, also a big uh, data that is increasingly used. Artificial intelligence at the same time uh, uh, seems to be uh, in the positive and opportunity aspect uh, can be a big help for research for uh, the virus, for finding the vaccine. Uh, and there is no doubt that the new normal, the new normal will be related and interrelated with, from UNIDO, we uh, call the fourth industrial revolution. And the fourth industrial revolution uh, has uh, a lot of opportunities, much more opportunities, opportunities for productivity, and uh, for the factory, uh, the way we work, the way we interact. And after COVID, this will all be changing. It will uh, receive another big push uh, from that uh, angle. Uh, we will change the way we, 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 we do everything. Uh, the virtual uh, element uh, has become a reality and the convergence of, of, of real and digital uh, is now a, a reality. We were talking also about blending learning, about uh, two, two worlds that come together, the robots and the people come together. But all this is coming also with uh, threats. It's coming also with a lot of risks and the poll have uh, 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 already addressed the potential cyber attacks. And, and this is why uh, we have to be very cautious to protect our customers, to protect the workers and to mitigate the risk and to decrease uh, uh, the, the way we can be uh, having another set of disruption. Uh, we live in, in this world of disruptions and uh, we are also living in a world where uh, we have a lot of data that is being um, uh, produced, but our main concern should be also the SMEs. We know that big companies uh, and, uh, and bigger players ha have been introducing uh, uh, a lot of uh, information security activities, but the SMEs, uh, if we would make the poll with SMEs, we would see another picture because they have no experience. Uh, maybe they are not ready to invest in this type of uh, uh, management system, in the technologies, because it's everything that is brought about with that. So today we will listen and uh, we are very happy that we are going to focus on 27,000. Uh, uh, I used to uh, uh, run uh, the capacity building today, uh, uh, working at, at ISO, and I remember very well that for the first time in 2003, uh, we ran a seminar and we brought an expert from Venezuela to Bolivia. Uh, and you know, at that occasion, the only ones that were interested to listen about 27,000 were the banks. Yeah, it was very interesting. The banks uh, participated, it was in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, and the insurance companies that participated in such a training. We hope definitely today this is mainstreaming to the industries. And as I say, we need to make sure that these uh, tools that are so powerful to help companies to be resilient can also help us uh, to bring to the smaller segment. Today we have with us uh, here, Dr. Uh, Edward Humphreys, 
uh, he is a senior advisor in the field of security and uh, a well-known personality in the ISO world because he has worked uh, for more than 40 years in IT security, but also with the standardization process, uh, being the convener of the ISO IEC uh, JTC uh, 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 working group SC27 on uh, information security management system standards. I, I hope I mentioned correctly the, 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 the label of this working group. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Humphreys is, is, is known as, as the father of this set of standards of information uh, security management system. He has been also very much recognized for the work and the strong uh, energy he put into converting this into accredited certification uh, around the world. You know, uh, first uh, step is to get a standard out, but uh, it is a big struggle to make it certifiable and such a standard that really makes sure that companies uh, are implementing security is very important in the business. So uh, uh, to finalize, uh, let me also indicate that Dr. Humphreys has been a visiting professor in various universities around the world, in Europe, but also in Asia. Uh, and he is currently also working in research, including cyberspace governments, uh, risk security and privacy and risk psychology. So uh, we have the right export for the right moment. Very happy uh, to have you with us, Dr. Uh, Edward Humphreys. So the floor is yours and we are all keen to listen to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just uh, bear with me. I want to uh, uh, get my slides up. Can everybody see my slides? Yeah, if you can put full screen, please. Yeah, I will do. Okay, so can everyone see my slides? Yeah, comments are coming in saying yes, everything is fine. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction, uh, Bernardo. Uh, yes, I'm, um, I'm responsible for the 27,000 family of standards uh, in ISO. Uh, I've been involved in ISO standards since 1982. So it's a long time ago, and I've seen many changes. Uh, but this particular standard has, um, has taken over the world, as we say, and it's become uh, a bestseller standard uh, and also a very popular standard. Uh, what I want to do is to just say a few words about COVID-19 and business, and then say a few words about uh, cyber risks. Um, I didn't know until we had these polls uh, where everybody came from. Uh, I didn't know what industry you were in, uh, whether you'd been certified, etc. So some of my slides might be, uh, you might be well aware of these, uh, the content of these slides when it comes to 27,001. Uh, some of the information might be new to you. Uh, but I had to start somewhere, so I went for the common denominator and assumed that some people didn't know too much about 27,001 itself. So I'd like to just give you my view of COVID-19 and business. Uh, business, I'm, I'm based in the UK, and the UK, like many other countries, are facing um, quite... Uh, big challenges when it comes to COVID. And businesses having to try and navigate through what they do with COVID-19 uh, in their own countries. And this could mean uh, all sorts of things, but certainly a lot of companies are having to prioritize what is critical and necessary so they can carry on doing business the best way they can. Of course, it's meant that there's been a lot of disruption to the way they work, their operations, how they deliver services, to supply chains, etc. It's also meant a lot of changes to workforce, reduced workforce, remote workforce. Some people are self-isolated and shielded, uh, and many other things. There's also 
the important thing of managing the uncertainty, responding as best uh, they can to the changing environment. People uh, working remotely, um, working with other companies that have a reduced uh, work function. But at the end of the day, and this is where 27,001 comes in, is that we are managing risk. We're trying to manage and mitigate risks uh, at all sorts of levels, financial risk, security risks, safety risks, etc. Now, there are two basic things I think is important about uh, COVID-19 and cyber risks. The world is focused in on both health and economic threats posed by COVID-19. But during, uh, within this um, situation where the world is focused, business is focused, governments are focused, citizens are focused, cyber crime is uh, quite, uh, quite active and they're taking advantage of this crisis. One way they're taking advantage is because normal business has been disrupted, they're taking advantage of that. And there are a number of threats and risks uh, related to this disruption of normal business. The other aspect of this is uh, exploiting on people's fears. So some of these uh, criminal groups are exploiting uh, people's fears uh, and in doing so are launching all sorts of attacks. Now, some of these attacks are not new attacks, they're old attacks, but they've been re-engineered to take advantage of COVID-19. I've put a little quote at the bottom of here from the first English dictionary published in 1601 that security is the fear of nothing. So these cyber criminals are taking advantage of uh, both the fact that companies are uh, being disrupted, having to work remotely, and also people's fears. And I've put some graphs here. Uh, one in particular is this uh, downward arrow showing going from a normal pre-COVID situation through to what might be the new normal. So it starts with business being disrupted. Then business has to decide how it's going to react and response to, uh, respond to this disruption. They need to uh, work out how they're going to adapt and recover and finally to revive its uh, normal working during this period of disruption, reaction, response, adaption, recovery, that is a period when cyber criminals are taking action against um, uh, businesses. Uh, a famous model, the uh, Kluber-Ross model, uh, is quite apt, quite appropriate in this situation because it shows you the initial COVID uh, uh, disruption starts, the shock, denial, fear, depression, and then businesses have to come out of this period and react and respond appropriately. Of course, that's again the period when um, cyber criminals are taking action and looking at the vulnerabilities of businesses and of users and citizens. So there are a number of themed cyber risks that are particular to COVID-19. The first one is related to health and safety. And there have been many um, attacks that have appeared over the last four to five months, explicitly uh, relating to health. Uh, I've seen uh, attacks which falsify uh, health and safety updates and the World Health Organization has, has also warned people about looking online about um, false news, false information. This also applies to governments that are issuing medical advice. So the criminals are targeting this type of information. There's also offering fake cures, vaccines, treatments, 
track and trace applications. Some of it's done for commercial gain. Some of it's got done just for pure uh, excitement of making people suffer beyond what they're already suffering. The other uh, theme is one where operations are being disturbed, disrupted. We see the normal uh, uh, phishing attacks, virus attacks, malware attacks have now been targeted specifically to COVID. So you see lots of ransomware attacks happening, fake websites, videos. Uh, just in the a cu last couple of days, um, a school of medicine in the US was sent a ransomware um, a, a ransomware attack was launched on this school of medicine and they said and what happened was that all the data uh, in that medical school was encrypted by the attackers and the attackers would only decrypt that data if a, a ransom was paid and the ransom was something like about 1.6 million dollars uh, the school actually did pay it because they needed to get that data back. So this is one example of many of the attacks that we've seen over the last four or five months. They're also taking advantage of reduced workforces and uh, employees and staff having to work remotely. So vulnerabilities in remote tools and software that people use uh, are now being targeted. The other area that's uh, seen a lot of attacks is in infrastructure. Infrastructure like healthcare, transport, <clears throat> finance, uh, food supplies. And so a number of the critical services have, have come under attack. Um, and also uh, supply chains involving small to medium sized enterprises uh, through to large companies and of course some small to medium sized enterprises don't have the capabilities the security capabilities that large play players do and so they also have been uh, targeted so cyber risks um, are being targeted not only to companies and employers but end users through to customers and through to citizens themselves. So the impact has been quite significant in a number of areas uh, over the last four or five months. And a lot of companies are asking questions. Are we resilient enough to withstand these attacks? Of course, you might ask the question, is this a wake up call? Are we going to learn lessons about what is happening now and information security? Do we have enough security in place, not only for today, but does this give us a wake up call for tomorrow? And it's also a reminder, are we actually regularly checking our security? We may have implemented security many years ago, but we don't keep it up to date. Uh, are we doing regular risk assessments? Are we continually improving our security? So cyber risks, and there are many of them, and I've only just listed a few of them. There are some that are related directly to the information, the confidentiality, integrity, availability information. There's attacks on personal information itself. There are many types of disruptive uh, and, uh, incidents. There's also the social engineering aspects where we are playing on the fears of people, hacking into people's minds, and encouraging them to do things that they wouldn't normally do. So there are many uh, types of attacks. As I said before, a number of these are old attacks, but they're being re-engineered and retargeted to take advantage and exploit and capitalize on the problems that businesses are having. Now, of course, this doesn't just uh, apply to commercial organizations, it's public utilities, governments, educational 
uh, institutions, like I just mentioned, School of Medicine in one of the schools of medicine in the US, nonprofit organizations. And most sectors are, fi are finding uh, problems due to the circumstances they're having to work uh, in during this pandemic. And of course, the end result is it could actually got, not just be the companies themselves, but also the end users, the consumers, and also the citizens that have been affected by this. So this is my uh, short introduction to what I see as the cyber risks. None of it's new, a lot of it's old risks that we've seen over the last few years, but it's being re-engineered and retargeted to take advantage, which is the normal thing that cyber criminals do. When a new issue comes up, a new um, problem in the world, they will re retarget, re-engineer um, old attacks uh, and apply them to the new circumstances. I now want to just move on quickly to uh, the, the activities of ISO, and I'm not going to spend too much on this on these next few slides because there's a lot of detail here, uh, and these slides will be made available to everybody. But ISO does have a, a number of groups uh, working either directly on security or indirectly on security, and I've mentioned some of these here, from software engineer, earring. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, internet of things, service management, cloud computing. But one group in particular is SC27, which is the committee I belong to. And this committee specifically deals with information security. And again, I'm not going to go through in detail this the structure of this group, but I'm involved in this one group called Working Group 1, who looks after 27,001 family. But as you can see, uh, the group deals with everything from cryptography, the evaluation and testing of products, through to privacy technologies. Now, just as a refresher for those already aware of 27,001, 27,001 is all about protecting information. And a number of these threats uh, that we see from cyber criminals at the end of the day will compromise information. 27001, very importantly, is a risk-based standard. It involves assessing the risks. And you can't do much about your information security unless you know what risks you face. Just as in the healthcare system, uh, business, you need to make a diagnosis of what the problem is, to find out what the risk to life is before you can uh, suggest appropriate treatment. So with information security, risk is the, an important aspect. And at the core of 27001 is the uh, notion of doing a risk assessment. Uh, and so it's making sure that the organizations do have a process in place for uh, assessing their risk and mitigating against those risks. And so 27001 is a standard that is entirely designed to help organizations deal with their information security risks. And it also um, helps organizations to fight against the cybercrime problems we're seeing at the moment with this pandemic. Protecting information, uh, it's often said that 27001 looks after these three aspects, tries to preserve the confidentiality of information, the integrity and the availability. Confidentiality means that some information might be sensitive and you want to stop unauthorized access to that information. The integrity of information is that you want to stop unauthorized modification. So, for example, in the case of medical data, you want that data to be as accurate as possible. So you want to try to protect it against being unauthorized modification or being destroyed or corrupted. 
And the other aspect is making sure that the information is available. So those that have authority uh, to access the information can have access to it. And again, uh, if you've got medical data, you want to make sure that doctors and nurses and clinicians have access to that data when they need it. So you need to protect also the availability of this information. And it's not just medical information, it could be personal information, business information, government information, research information. So 27,001 cuts across the whole board, the whole spectrum of uh, sectors and businesses. And wherever that information is used, 27,001 should be there protecting um, the confidentiality, integrity, availability of that information. So another aspect of, of 27,001, apart from the risk, is that it is a standard that allows companies to continually evolve their protection against uh, cyber risks. So the, the key word that's often used uh, in all these types of standards, these management system standards, is continual improvement. So we do have this cycle that we know what our risks are, we try to uh, treat those risks by implementing controls uh, and countermeasures, policies and procedures. But we don't stop there. After we've implemented those things, we continue to evaluate our system. We monitor how our system is performing. We do reviews, internal audits. And if our system needs to be improved, we improve it. So like all the other management systems, 9,000, 14,000, 28,000, 27,001 is exactly the same, but it's addressing this issue of information security. So the key, word is, key words are risk and also continual improvement. And so if I was to summarize 27,001, it's basically to minimize the risks that we face as organizations. Those risks that might have an impact, have a disruptive or destructive effect on our business. At the same time, we want to um, protect our investments that we've made. We spend money on security, we want to maximize and protect that investment. Also, uh, we want to provide confidence and assurance that we are doing the right thing, that we do have uh, uh, security in place to protect ourselves. And that could be for our customers, our clients, and also the stakeholders uh, in our business. And again, 27,001 covers all sectors, is a, a fairly general standard in that sense. It applies to everybody, everybody, every type of organization, that handles information, information that might be sensitive, information that might be critical, information that might be personal. So this is just a, a quick uh, um, introduction to 27001. As you can see from this slide and all the chapters in the standard itself, um, there's a lot of things going on here there's aspects of knowing what your organization is about, understanding what needs security in your organization and what doesn't need security. Also making sure that you have the right leadership management in place. Also uh, that you have the right resources, the, the right support to support information security so that covers the resources to look after the security, how competent the staff is in, um, in dealing with security, making sure that there's adequate awareness in the organization, uh, awareness and training, that you're communicating things properly in the organization. There's also the other aspects of planning and operation, doing a risk assessment, making sure that you understand your risk assessment 
the risks you face and that you know what to do about it. Um, then there's also the follow-up actions, the performance evaluation, monitoring, reviewing, etc. And then finally doing uh, uh, some improvement. Another aspect of the standard, of course, is that there is a set of baseline controls that can be used uh, to mitigate the risks. So very briefly, uh, the risk assessment is you need to decide on the criteria um, to, <clears throat> for, your, for carrying out your risk assessment. You need to do a risk assessment and then you need to treat the, treat the risk to mitigate against the risks. And what we do have is we need to select controls, the right controls that will uh, mitigate those risks. These can be uh, controls that you've designed in your business, controls that you already have as a standard or a code of practice in your business. They may be controls that come from other ISO standards uh, or other types of standards. And of course, then we do have this inbuilt baseline set of controls that once you've selected your controls, you check whether you've adequately covered all the different types, whether it's access control, physical controls, operational controls, um, supplier relationships, etc. And then we can go through after we've implemented the controls through to putting them into operation and use and then do the follow up, follow up actions of performance evaluation. I'm not gonna go through this slide because it's so busy, but it's there for background information. When you do receive this slide, it shows you that 27,001 is supported by a, a, a very large number of other standards. Some of these standards called guidelines help you implement what's in 27,001. Some of them are related to sectors specifically, like 27,001 is related to telecoms, 17 and 18 are related to cloud, 27,019 is related to the energy sector. So there is a wealth of standards that's been developed to support 27,001. So 27,001 is a high level standard, but it's important is to do a risk assessment. From there onwards, you will decide what other standards you might need to support uh, the requirements of mitigating against the risks. And as I say, um, this is only a small sample of all the standards that are available. And as you can see from this table here, there are standards that go into a great uh, amount of detail on network security, application security. Uh, on security for the Internet of Things through to the privacy aspects. So 27,001 over the last 15 years has built up uh, a, a, a large suite of standards that helps all organizations. Another aspect of what we're facing today in this pandemic is to do with resilience. And this 27,001 is related to resilience. One of the statements by Charles Darwin is, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the species that's the most adaptable to change. And business are facing this particular issue today. Are they able to adapt to change? Are they able to adapt to what they're seeing? having to remote to to work remotely having supply chains uh, disrupted etc 27001 uh, is a standard that acknowledges this uh, this quote way from way back in the victorian times because it has all the right elements for doing a risk assessment monitoring the situation and then having this idea of continual improvement. So you do adapt to the changes 
that are taking place in your business environment. Cyber resilience is how do you, do you have that capacity to manage disruptive risks? And so alongside 27001, there is another important management system standard to do with business continuity, which is very, very important in this pandemic um, situation we're in. So one of the important things is to look and to monitor what's happening in your environment. We do have a, a number of companies where their security teams are having to work, work remotely. They're having to deal with uh, the, the security of their organization, but doing this remotely. And that can be very challenging. Um, I know many organizations that I've been working with over the last uh, four or five months who have, I've been giving advice to of how to do their normal security jobs remotely. And it is difficult. It's not always easy. But they have to learn to adapt to change and learn very, very quickly. And the more resilience they have to be able to make these changes to be flexible whilst maintaining a good level of security is very, very important. So the standard that uh, goes alongside 27001 is uh, 22301, which is a business continuity management system standard. They both uh, focus in on this issue of risk. So if your system is attacked, in any way, you need to have some form of incident handling process. So one of our complementary standards is 27,035. We need to be prepared for an attack. We need to be able to detect, analyze, and evaluate that attack. We need to try and contain uh, it as best as possible. We need to recover as best as possible. So this is also like a blueprint, a template for um, businesses are having to deal with disruption uh, during this pandemic. The last thing I want to talk about is, is certification. Um, certification, uh, management system certification, be it 9,000 for quality and 14,000 for environment, also applies to 27,001. And we do have a number of uh, participants that have been certified. Uh, some uh, participants um, are thinking about it. Uh, some, some participants haven't been certified. But certification does provide uh, a degree of confidence and assurance to interested parties, be they customers, be they customers, or uh, stakeholders, the, the company has done something to fulfill uh, its security uh, obligations. So they've done something to do a risk assessment, to put in the right controls in place, to meet the requirements of 27001. Uh, and uh, that they do have a, uh, a management system that's being continually uh, evaluated, reviewed, and where changes need to be made, they will be made. So it's a demonstration that they are doing something about security and they have achieved uh, a reasonable level to protect, of security to protect against the risks. We do have a number of standards that apply to this a particular issue which are focused in on 27,001. So anybody that's uh, interested in uh, certification, these are some important standards um, to bear in mind. Of course, one of the um, questions is what's happening to certification audits during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Now, certification uh, audits do involve uh, 
visiting companies and checking out their security. So it involves on-site uh, inspections and assessments. Uh, now, most uh, certification bodies are actually uh, doing these, trying to do these things remotely, or they're having these certification audits deferred. Where they are doing remote assessments, some of these are being done by Zoom, Skype, and other platforms. But the important thing, both for the certification bodies and for the clients, are protecting the health and safety. So, as you can imagine, um, audit staff don't want to go into a company uh, and have a problem with health and safety. Likewise, the clients themselves don't want audit staff going in for the same reasons. There's also the travel to the sites, social distancing, personal protection, etc. So certification bodies and accreditation bodies are trying to maintain market confidence and trust in the certification process. Uh, and so there is a lot of um, uh, issues around this particular problem. I've just put down here a few frequently asked questions. Uh, there are many of these. How do you carry out technical assessments remotely? Edward? Yes? Apologies for the interruption. Just a couple more minutes to wrap up because we need to do some uh, questions and answers. Sure. Um, what if I can't have something assessed on my, site, on my site remotely? Is there any flexibility with regard to times? Um, what about if I postpone an audit? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, although certification, well, certification is a very important uh, part of 27001 implementation, uh, we, we do have, or certification bodies, and accreditation bodies have started to look at these particular issues and they're working closely with their clients to try to make up, to, to deal with, well, to, um, to decide on what the most appropriate arrangements are. So uh, that's a, a very quick um, overview of many different topics. The slides will be available, I understand, and there's a lot in these slides. So. With that, I would like to conclude and take any questions. Edward, thanks very much for that. Um, you've had a number of comments saying they're very grateful and they, they find it extremely informative. So as you said, we will provide these slides to everyone and a video recording of this session will be hosted on the Eyes on Unida website. Now, a um, couple of questions that have come through uh, during the registration that I would like to raise to you, if that's possible. Sure. And the first one is, how can we undertake assessments <coughs> and audits witnessing during the current COVID-19 situation? Okay, well, <clears throat> as I've just was started to explain, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, assessments are, some assessments are being carried out remotely. Uh, where it is possible to uh, visit a site, then that will happen. So you'll, you'll find that, uh, mo as far as I know, a lot of the assessments are being done remotely. Um, of course, alternative to doing an assessment remotely is having the assessment deferred or postponed to another occasion. If you are a company that does that's in that position, that you do have a, an assessment planned or for the near future, then you should contact your certification body as soon as possible. Because every certification body may have a different way of uh, doing remote assessments, deciding whether to defer the assessment to a later date, so the first thing that an organization should do is go to your certification body and discuss with them 
uh, what is the best and most suitable arrangement for your business needs. So in summary, it's either going to be a, a remote um, uh, assessment or a deferred assessment. And in some cases, some, not all, there may still be a, a partial on-site uh, assessment. I hope that covers most things. Thank you, Edward. Uh, the next question we have is that, uh, do you have any examples where the ISO IEC 27001 has been referred to in legislation? Uh, yes, I, not only do I have examples, that, but we do have a document that we produced uh, a few years ago. We did a survey in my committee looking at the use of 27001 in both government and regulatory uh, environments. And uh, this survey, which is in a public document, uh, lists uh, examples which shows uh, 27,000 being quoted in regulatory documents, both in the public sector, in finance, energy, uh, healthcare, communications, uh, and uh, multimedia. Uh, there are many countries listed in this survey. Amongst them are uh, Australia, Germany, India, India, Italy, Luxembourg, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Norway, Peru, Poland, Sweden, and Switzerland, uh, and also the European Union. So, for example, uh, in Germany, uh, the Federal Network Agency in Germany uh, quote uh, 27001 and 27002 both in uh, legislation related to multimedia, communications and energy. Uh, in India, the Information Technology Act of 2011 quotes 27001. Uh, in Switzerland, the Federal Office of Public Health uh, mentions 27001. And I could go on and on and on. There are many examples. Uh, the document I'm referring to is um, a public document uh, and I think um, uh, the organization of this organizers of this webinar might like to to share that with you but it's up to them but it is a public document listing many many examples thank you Edward we'll share that um, and another question is, uh, why is 27001 relevant today? And is there a competitive advantage in being certified? Well, I think 27001, I might be sad, sounding biased here because, <laughs> um, but 27001 is, is relevant today as it was in 2005 when it was first made an ISO standard. And it's gonna be relevant tomorrow. And a simple, my simple explanation of this is that it is based on doing a risk assessment. And risks are as important yesterday as they are tomorrow. And this standard makes organizations do a risk assessment, makes them uh, get into that discipline of doing a risk assessment and keeping that risk assessment up to date. And as we know, this pandemic has shown that we need to be very, very wary of, of, the, of the risks that, that cyber criminals are uh, posing to organizations. So unless we know what those risks are, we can't do much about it. And because 27001 has as its core risk management, then it's as relevant today as it is uh, tomorrow or yesterday. The other aspect, uh, of course, is that uh, we have to adopt, or sorry, we have to adapt to change. And also embedded within 27001, as I explained, is this um, doing a risk assessment, looking at um, the performance of what you've got in place, and then doing continual improvement. So this helps us to keep up to date. So 
my argument is it's as relevant today as it will be in uh, uh, in years to come. Now, I will say another aspect of this is that all ISO standards come up for review on a periodic basis, and they we this happens because there may be things in the standard that just need to be added or uh, slightly improved. So the standards themselves go, uh, uh, go under a process of continued improvement. So not only is 27,000 as it is today's published, uh, as it is published today, relevant because of risk assessment and continued improvement, but the standard itself goes through a process of continued improvement to make it relevant, to make it appropriate to whatever debt uh, year we are talking about. Um, the second part of this question is, uh, is uh, what's the advantages of being certified? Well, many companies uh, have uh, gone for certification to demonstrate that they do have uh, adequate security in place, adequate and effective security in place. And they do that to demonstrate to their customers but also to their stakeholders. It might be also the case that certification is required for legal purposes. I also know a number of examples where uh, their customers and clients also require uh, the company to be certified for contractual reasons. So it's a good uh, tool for demonstrating that you've got the right security in place, uh, demonstrating that to your customers, your stakeholders, and also for legal and contractual requirements. Uh, and of course, it also is useful in, for internal reasons. It also puts a certain discipline into the organization that they should uh, look at their security resources, what protection they've got, and make sure that they are continually up to date and they can be up to date by doing a risk assessment and doing improvements. So internally it's also very, very useful and doing, having a, a certification, uh, which is a third party activity is someone uh, outside of your organization is coming in and checking that you are um, doing things properly according to the standard. Thank you, Edward. Um, well, I think uh, we are, you know, basically at the end of our allotted time now. So what we've mentioned also at the beginning, for those of you who may not have joined right at the beginning, uh, we will make the presentation available to everyone after the webinar. We will also have this recording uh, available for everyone after the webinar. The number of questions that we have received will basically require us uh, to review them after the webinar and see what the best option is uh, for us to address them, whether that is through another session to try and address them or uh, through a report. This is yet to be determined, but uh, just so that you know, those of you that ask questions, they haven't been ignored. It's just that we've unfortunately run out of time. Now, um, I would like to really say uh, thank you at this point to Edward and to Bernardo. Um, and uh, I would like to extend also my gratitude to UNIDO for our partners for these special webinars. And I don't know if uh, Bernardo, you'd like to say a few words as well in closing, but you are welcome to do so. And um, yeah, Bernardo, please take the floor. Yes, uh, no, thank you very much. I, there's not much I, I need to say. A special thanks to, to Edward. I have been following his uh, uh, speech with a lot of attention. Uh, this topic uh, is very, very uh, important today, very topical, uh, we need to follow, and I hope with ISO we can uh, do some follow-up actions to really bring this message to the SMEs, and I hope also we can collaborate with Edward. Thank you very much, and thank you to the audience. Thank you for all those uh, back the scenes that help us to organize the seminar. But I think a special thank to all the audience. We had over 250 colleagues, uh, the audience following the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.